Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our next lecture this afternoon is going to be given by Dr. Roger Garrison from Auburn University, and the title of his lecture is on the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Roger? Okay, I think this is the fifth lecture that you've attended today, so you're all gluttons for punishment. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you coming to still another lecture, but there's, what, two more, so uh, <laughs> it's a long day. Uh, the official title of this lecture is Austrian Theory of the Business Cycle. Uh, in my book, uh, I generalize a little bit and call it capital-based macroeconomics. I think the Austrians have a full-fledged uh, macroeconomic system, uh, the best developed part of it, undoubtedly, is the Austrian theory but my, uh, of the business cycle, but my book uh, contains uh, fiscal policy and, and all sorts of other uh, applications of uh, capital-based macroeconomics. Uh, uh, I'd like to give you a little roadmap at the beginning, just to show you where we're going and uh, put this uh, theory in perspective, and one way to do it is, is showing you the what I call the elements of uh, capital-based macroeconomics. And it goes like this. Uh, some of the elements are just off-the-shelf uh, graphical devices that the Austrians can put in use in a way that the Keynesians can't and that the monetarists don't, okay? Uh, and the first among them is this uh, production possibilities frontier. I'm sure if you've taken Econ 101, you've seen a production possibilities frontier uh, that shows you a trade-off uh, between one thing and another. You can't get more of one thing without giving up some of the other. Uh, and you'll see that that's uh, unique in certain respects uh, to, the, to the Austrian theory. Uh, the loanable funds market is a market you've uh, heard about already from uh, Jeff Herbener and possibly others. It's simply the market, very broadly defined, that uh, brings into balance uh, um, uh, the supply and the demand for loanable funds uh, and gives us a market rate of interest, market clearing uh, rate of interest. More about that uh, shortly. Uh, something called the structure of production is very unique to Austrian theory. You don't find it in Keynesian theory. You don't find it in monetarist theory. Capital has a structure to it, uh, as Professor Herbener has uh, detailed uh, in his lecture. And uh, stage-specific labor markets. If you've all taken macro uh, in, uh, from one textbook or another in different schools of thought, uh, you usually integrate something called the labor market, as if there's only one, and it turns out that uh, in capital-based macro, uh, we have a, uh, several labor markets that we have to keep separate uh, depending on what stage of production the labor is working in. So those are the uh, elements of capital-based macro. We'll see how to put them together in what I think is a particularly illuminating way. And then uh, applications of capital-based macro, or at least of the business cycle theory, uh, it goes like this, that we can portray sustainable growth. And what we'll see is that sustainable growth is based on your willingness to save. Uh, think about what saving means. Uh, you go to work and you produce stuff, you get paid for it, it's called income, and you don't spend all the income, you save part of it. Uh, that means essentially that you didn't consume as much as you produced. And that difference is real saving, it's, it's the stuff you produce that's available for expanding the productive capacity of the economy. Uh, business people take command of that saving. If you save it in a bank, they borrow it and use it to buy those unconsumed resources to expand the capital base. That gives you sustainable growth. Uh, that's one application. In fact, we'll actually probably spend more of our time on that application, and once we do, uh, we'll see that the other application is really just a, a corollary, a corollary. It's unsustainable growth, which turns out doesn't involve increased saving. In fact, it involves decreased saving, but it also involves credit expansion. And so 
growth based on credit expansion turns out not to be sustainable. It turns out to be a boom uh, that contains the seeds of its own undoing and causes the economy to collapse. We've seen it several times in the last uh, few decades and saw it big time in this last uh, financial crisis. Okay, so let's see where we go from here. Uh, I don't need to spend too much time showing you who come up with these ideas. Uh, it's uh, Mises and Hayek. And, uh, but it's interesting to note that uh, this Austrian theory was stated pretty concisely, but pretty thoroughly too at the same time, by Mises as early as 1912. Okay, we're talking about decades before Keynes uh, wrote the general theory. And it was developed in the 1920s and into the 30s, uh, mostly before uh, Keynes wrote the general theory. So it was, a, it was a competitor of Keynes' view and actually preceded it uh, by some years. I'm going to introduce one methodological precept that uh, commands assent, I think, just on reading it. And this is a paraphrase from Hayek. Uh, and he says, before we can even ask how things go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. Uh, and what you'll see in this lecture is that I'll spend most of my time showing you how things could go right. And once you understand that, then it's pretty easy not only to see how they can go wrong, but to see the particulars of their going wrong and how it manifests itself uh, as an artificial boom uh, followed by a bust. This is a methodological maxim that is observed in the breach, uh, as they say. Uh, Keynes didn't address the question of how things could ever go right because he didn't think they ever could. He didn't think there was anything in the market system uh, that would allow savings to be brought in line with investment at full employment. That mechanism just wasn't there. Uh, and therefore, the possibility of things going right wasn't there, so he didn't spend any time on it. Uh, if you look at the monetarist theory, uh, you see a tacit assumption that things go right. Okay, there's a, monitors are very market-oriented. Uh, they think markets work, uh, but uh, they don't begin their macro theory by showing just how, so they can go back and show what might go wrong. So it, it's the Austrians that take up this preliminary question uh, with all degree of uh, seriousness. So I'll start with this production possibilities frontier, uh, and you know what it looks like. Uh, you have two axes. I've got uh, consumption uh, on the vertical axis. I hope you can see it. It's a little bit dim. Lights in here are kind of bright. Consumption on the vertical axis and investment uh, on the horizontal axis. Um, we could spend time explaining why it's bowed outwards, but uh, you probably know about that. And anyhow, the more important part is it slopes downward. In other words, uh, you can get more consumption, but only if you give up some investment, or you get more investment, but only if you give up some consumption. Uh, that's the PPF. Now, even at this early point in the exposition, you see a huge difference between Hayek and Keynes. Uh, how many have had a basic course where you learn Keynesian theory? You learn the Keynesian cross. So, oh, I hate to see that. <laughs> 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 but what you, what you remember about it is consumption and investment rendered C and I, or C plus I, you add them together. You add them together. And the significance is that, the, that it's spending. And for Keynes, it doesn't really matter who spends what they spend on, just so you get plenty of it. Consumption spending plus investment spending. Uh, in the Austrian case, you look at, you look at the trade-off between using resources for consumption purposes and using resources for uh, investment purposes. Okay. Now, it says under favorable conditions, that means markets are allowed to work, essentially. Uh, the economy will find itself at some point on the PPF. Now, this is macro. So uh, the, uh, the uh, point on the PPF is a point of so-called full employment. And you all know from taking macro, the full employment doesn't mean 0% unemployment, does it? It means 
the natural rate of unemployment. That's Friedman's uh, term, but it's a good one, uh, which is to say five or six percent unemployment of people just looking for jobs between jobs just out of college or whatever. Uh, so it allows for some unemployment. A healthy economy has some amount of unemployment. And I stress this because I'll show you an exception, even at this early point, to the PPF, that the PPF uh, essentially says you can't go outside of it. Well, it doesn't quite say that. You can't go outside of it on a sustainable basis. The economy can't be pushed below full employment level of unemployment on a permanent basis. It can be pushed that way temporarily. In fact, that's, that's part of the essence of the boom. So it's possible to push the economy beyond the PPF, but not sustainably. It'll come back uh, to the PPF and maybe even go inside of it. So uh, I'll alert you to that aspect of the model, even at this early stage. Uh, and here, just a reminder, the PPF shows up in all the textbooks. It's in the early chapters. It gives a workout in micro. It comes up in growth theory or in comparing one country with another in terms of investment and consumption. But you never see it integrated with a macro model. And that's what I'm doing here today. I'm, I'm bringing it in uh, in a macro uh, relevant way. Uh, it also shows this difference between Hayek and Keynes. Our CNI trade-offs or our CNI just two ways of uh, spending, okay? Uh, the investment there is on the horizontal axis. Uh, that's gross investment. That's the way the macro uh, books are written, gross investment. Uh, and it shows you about that magnitude, that horizontal distance is gross investment. Uh, a lot of that, though, is making good on depreciation, capital replacement, uh, obsolete machines that have to be replaced, and so on. And so a big part of the gross investment is, I call it replacement capital, uh, making good on capital depreciation, wear and tear and obsolescence, and breakage, and, and so on. Maybe as much as 70% or so of total investment in a year uh, is uh, of that form. But typically, in a healthy economy, uh, there's some investment above and beyond that, okay? And that's net investment, uh, which of course is the difference. The net investment is a net addition to the capital structure in some way or another. It's, it's an enhancement of uh, the capital that allows for greater levels of production uh, than we had before, uh, which is to say, uh, that if you have positive net investment, uh, the economy will be doing better next year. In other words, the trade-off will allow for both more consumption and more investment. This PPF is based on a particular year. Next year, things will be better simply because you've got net investment, okay? Uh, so that outward shifting of the PPF, it, that's sustainable growth. It's based on your saving, uh, that represent resources that you created and didn't consume. They were taken command of by the investment community by borrowing your saving and put to use in expanding the capacity uh, of the economy to produce, okay? So that's what we want to understand. So watch the economy grow. Okay, you're gonna hear the economy grow, okay? The economy grows. This is the market at work, okay, for you and for me. Okay, and it shows you about four steps, uh, and uh, at that level, uh, we have uh, a more prosperous economy. Uh, the actual rate of expansion depends on a lot of things. Uh, capital depreciation increases too. Uh, there might be technological innovations that uh, give a boost to growth. Uh, there may be uh, other sorts uh, of changes. It may be that people with higher incomes choose to save even more of their income and cause the economy to grow faster. It's a historical fact, if, uh, if not a praxeological truth, that as incomes rise, the percentage of saving uh, tends to increase. So the faster it grows, 
it grows faster still and so on. Uh, I've ignored those second order effects. Um, that's what that says there. Okay, now importantly, uh, that's a word I probably should have underlined, uh, a change in saving preferences which provokes the movement along the PPF affects the rate at which the PPF expand, expands outward. And this seems kind of unremarkable. Uh, suppose people become more thrifty, more future oriented. Okay, so they save more, then there's more uh, that uh, investors could borrow. There's more resources they can take command of. The economy grows still faster. And I say importantly only because other schools of thought tend to ignore this. Uh, Keynes, for one, argued that uh, people save exclusively on the basis of their current income. He didn't allow for changes in uh, saving preference. That was no part uh, of his story. And one of the things the Austrians do is they, they, that's a choice that people make, and they can make different choices at different times, and they can certainly decide uh, to save more. Okay, so watch the movement along the PPF. If uh, people save more, it means they're consuming less, and so uh, the economy is gonna move along that frontier in a clockwise direction. Let's watch it move, there it goes, okay? It doesn't seem remarkable. I mean, it uh, sort of stands to reason from the very definition of the PPF that you could move along it. That second P in PPF means possibility. It's possible to move along the frontier. And you just saw it move, <laughs> okay? It can do it. Uh, it doesn't do it, though, in, uh, in Keynesian theory. And of course, uh, with saving and investment greater now, the economy grows, but at a faster rate, okay? So here we go. Now watch the economy grow. And you can see it's bigger steps jumping out there farther each time because you started off with some saving. Uh, we can even compare. Uh, it's that increased saving that made the difference, and you can compare uh, with the old uh, trade-off <clears throat> before that increase in saving. And what you see is that uh, with the, without the initial increase, yeah, you've got an expansion, uh, but with the initial saving, uh, you got a big boost there. So, some saving, <clears throat> which gave, uh, gave the growth rate a little kick, uh, and the economy grew faster. Uh, and you can see that if you compare one with the other, after four uh, years in this uh, particular illustration, <clears throat> people are now consuming more than they would have consumed had they not saved uh, in the beginning. Now, I'm at risk here of sounding like your parents. <laughs> you people should save more, you know. It'll be good for you. You'll wish you had, you know. Listen to me. No, no, that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, Hayek's point, Mises' point, was that the economy grows in accordance with how much you're willing to save. Save a little, it grows slowly. Save a lot, it grows faster. But you make the choice, okay? Consumption is good too. All right, so you make the choice, and the choice you make uh, will uh, determine how fast the economy grows. Uh, if I wanted to give you an admonition, uh, I would say, don't save a little, and then vote for politicians who pledge to grow the economy. <laughs> okay, that's a formula for disaster. Okay, the market for loanable funds, uh, and here, we're looking at the interest rate very broadly conceived. The most uh, explicit manifestation of loans would be just bank loans. You borrow from the bank. It lends you money, you borrow the money, that's it. Uh, but really, we're talking about all sorts of ways in financial markets that your saving gets transferred to the entrepreneur for, for investment purposes, all right? Uh, that's how broadly defined it is. And the saving, of course, slopes upward like all other saving curves. Uh, the more interest you can get on money you lend, uh, the more you're willing to lend. Okay, it's true for you and for banks and so on. Uh, the demand, uh, of course, is downward sloping. It means entrepreneurs 
are more likely to borrow money to invest if they can get it cheap. Uh, this is a supply and demand curve like any other, and if markets are working right, uh, then we get a market clearing rate of interest uh, and an equality between saving and investment. That's what that equality means, even in Keynesian economics. You end up with an equality between saving and investment. It's just not one that's brought about by changes in the interest rate. According to the Austrians, that's how you get that equality between saving and investment, by appropriate adjustments in the interest rate. Let the market adjust to its own level, uh, and uh, that will get you the equality. Right? And beware of policymakers who manipulate the interest rate, because that's the thing that will throw the economy off uh, for sure. Okay? It's interesting that an old Austrian economist, Bohm Bavarek and Keynes, agreed that this market is defined in such a way that the horizontal axis is what it represents investable resources. Okay, those are the investable resources that the entrepreneurs take command over uh, and that uh, were made available by the fact that you didn't spend all your income. Okay, you saved instead and they took command of it. So that's what that's all about. That's invest, investment and saving measured separately on the horizontal axis the rate of interest on uh, the vertical axis, all right? Here I'm just showing you that uh, that market for loanable funds drawn just as I drew it here is associated with Dennis Robertson, a British economist, a, critique, a critic of uh, Keynes, a uh, friend of Keynes at least early on, but Keynes wouldn't take all that much criticism, and so he didn't really remain a lifelong friend. But that's Dennis Robertson. Uh, and another important thing that will also come back uh, in a second lecture I give uh, tomorrow is that when Roy Herod, uh, another colleague, or not colleague, but friend of uh, Keynes, uh, read the manuscript of the general theory, he was dumbstruck, thinking, my God, uh, Keynes has rejected the loanable funds theory of interest. Uh, and it turns out that uh, Keynes had. Uh, and Herod convinced him that, gee, if, if that's what you're doing, you better make it very uh, explicit. Uh, and so this diagram, uh, how many have thumbed through the general theory? Anybody in here? You look through the general theory? One thing you notice, there are no graphs. You'd think there'd be a lot of graphs. There are no graphs in the general theory, none, except, oh, except one, except one. And that's it, the loanable funds theory. He put it in because Herod told him to, and he put it in to show that this was what he's throwing out, okay? That was the story. So it's essential to the Austrian view and gets thrown out uh, in the Keynesian view. Now here, uh, with the loanable funds theory, let people become more future-oriented. Assume that preferences change in favor of saving rather than consuming today so that they can consume more in the future, all right? Watch the saving curve shift rightward. You think it can do it? Of course it can. This is the market at work, okay? It shifts rightward. It lowers the rate of interest. Market is bid down to a lower rate of interest. And uh, it uh, gives the incentive for entrepreneurs to borrow more funds and undertake more investment activities. At low rates of interest, uh, investment activities are profitable that weren't profitable before. That's the way uh, markets work, okay? So the interest rate goes down, the amount of saving and investment uh, increases. That gives you, again, sustainable economic growth. We're showing now just how, you know, how the market actually works, okay? And here I'm just showing you that the two views I've given you are just two perspectives on the same thing that's going on. So we can put them on uh, the screen at the same time. They look like this and they line up because that horizontal axis is investable resources in both diagrams, all right? Uh, so the loanable fund shows that the interest rate brings saving and investment into balance with one another, and the PPF shows what the trade-off is between investment and uh, consumption, right? 
Now what I want you to do, uh, oh, it just an, uh, almost a footnote, markets adjust adjustments in output prices, wage rates, and input prices keep the economy functioning on the PPF. That's again to say the market is presumably working in all those dimensions, all right? So these two graphs together can show you a more comprehensive view of uh, the effects of an increase in saving. Uh, as before, we're going to uh, suppose that people get more future-oriented in their thinking. Uh, and uh, it says, watch this saving-induced decrease in interest rate and corresponding movement along the PPF. What you have to do is turn your head sideways and one eye look at one graph and the other eye look at the other graph. So let's watch this. Okay. So everything lines up. I mean, this is a little bit of harmony in the, the uh, economic harmonies here. That uh, it, it all lines up. More investment both places. Uh, interest rate failed to bring you along the PPF. You stayed at full employment because wages are adjusting and so on. Um, and that's what that says there. We don't need to read it. Uh, now, this is important to recognize that even the possibility of that happening was denied by Keynes. Uh, note that the investment undertaken is positive, and yet consumption has fallen. Okay. Well, of course, I mean, that's, that's what it means to move along this negatively slow PPF. You give up one thing in order to get more of something else. You're really giving up current consumption in order to get more future consumption. And the way you get more future consumption is through more investment, which is brought about by the lower interest rate uh, that, uh, that was brought about by your increased saving. I mean, it all, it all fits uh, together. And this last paragraph is sort of reminds you, let me apologize for reminding you of this, but a uh, 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 remind you of what the Keynesian uh, scenario is. Uh, and according to the Keynesian scenario, oh, if people reduce spending, then that will reduce investment. If you can't sell the stuff you've already got on the shelves, why build, why make more of it? And if you reduce investment, then or reduce, yeah, investment, then that reduces employment and that reduces income, and then income reduces consumption some more, and it keeps reducing. The economy spirals down. It doesn't go along the PPF. It goes inside the PPF. Okay, that's what Keynes said. And in fact, it even has a name, it's called the paradox of thrift. Don't save, don't save because your reduction in spending will throw the economy into depression. That's Keynes, that's the paradox of thrift. Hayek is there to say, if, if markets are working, if markets are allowed to work, it will move the economy along uh, the PPF, okay? Now, there's certain plausibility to Keynes. And I think what we can say is, if he's simply talking about inventories at retail, investment in the form of stocking goods on the shelf, then surely he's right. That if, if people quit going into Target as much as they were before, and they're not buying stuff on the shelves, and the shelves are just full of merchandise and don't need to be restocked, well, Target will cut back on how much merchandise it orders. And so it's true that investment in the late stages of production move with consumption. I probably say that there. Uh, yeah, it says it in the top paragraph, but then in the next paragraph, it says there's another effect. There's another effect, a different effect, and that's the reduction of the interest rate. If the interest rate's reduced, it makes long-term investment, it's getting wicked out there, isn't it? It makes long-term investment more profitable, reduces the rate of interest, uh, increases uh, the willingness of investors to borrow uh, and uh, build uh, the capital stock. And so it moves in the opposite direction for early stage uh, investments. And this is what we'll have to do next here, let's see. To keep track of these changes, we need to say something about the structure of production. That's why the structure of production uh, comes into play. And here, I'm going to take advantage of Professor Herbener's lecture, where he talked about Menger, 
I'm not sure he mentioned Menger's Law, but I can show you what that is easily enough. Uh, and he talked about orders of goods. He talked about goods of the first order, uh, that's consumption goods, it turns out, and then goods of higher order. There's second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. I put him in that array, but so the seventh good will be highest order, okay? And look at that goods of the first order, that's just consumption goods. And the rest are intermediate goods, higher order goods, all right? Now, what I'm saying is that Keynes' reasoning about the paradox of thrift is true if he's talking only about goods of the second order, and a little less true for goods of the third order. And by the time he gets up to the fifth, sixth, and seventh order, he's got it backward, because those orders uh, are seriously affected by the low rate of interest. Those are long-term investments. It'll be a long time before uh, they show up as consumption output. Uh, and uh, they're particularly interest rate sensitive, simply because they're long term. And so those get a stimulus, all right? Now, in order to get back to my own representation, here, well, here is Minger's point. Uh, he was doing battle with the classical <coughs> economists, with Ricardo and so on, that was still uh, the dominant view of, of his day, of Minger's day. And, and Ricardo had a cost of production theory about, of value. It's, it's because of the costs incurred uh, that the output has value. Uh, Minger turned that around. He says, no, it's true that production takes place in time from the highest orders down to the lowest orders, but the valuation goes the other way. In other words, it's those goods of higher orders that get their value from the prospective value of the consumer goods they will produce. So he, he reversed that uh, belief. That, that was a big part of the marginless revolution and Minger's part of it. Now, what I do now is show you that uh, Hayek put some analytical legs on this thing. And uh, what I'm superimposing here is uh, a page out of Hayek's Prices and Production. Instead of talking about orders of goods, he talks about stages of production, okay? Orders of good becomes stages of production, and it looks like that, and he drew it that way. Uh, and so he had the production shown from top to bottom, uh, and then the horizontal component of that last, the uh, last leg, or the last uh, element, uh, is the level of consumption. Okay, um, clean that up a bit, it looks like that. The one thing that, that bothered me about that diagram, it's just an, partly an aesthetic thing and partly uh, making it align with my other graphics, is the time element in Hayek is on the vertical axis and time is coming down the vertical axis. <laughs> That's rather strange. Wouldn't it be better to have time going left to right along the horizontal axis? Is there some way to do that? Is there any way to do that? <laughs> it's easy, okay? You do it that way. And when you do that then, <clears throat> again, this is the Hayekian triangle. Production time is a sequence of stages. It goes left to right uh, along the horizontal axis. And if we superimpose a triangle, I mean, that is the famous uh, Hayekian triangle. Uh, which, which really is a sort of almost an iconic symbol uh, of those stages uh, of production. It looks like that, okay? Now I'll go back to my own uh, rendition. And uh, the capital-based macro requires us to look at this temporal structure of production. Uh, and uh, we do that here. I'm going to use uh, five stages. Actually, that's what Hayek used five stages, but once the economy had grown, a few pages later, it was up to seven stages, which is what I used in the earlier graphic. So there's stages of production along the horizontal leg, and that consumption on the vertical leg, it's not a vertical axis, it's, it's the height of the vertical dimension of the triangle. In other words, the other vertical lines between the stages are the value of the output of that stage. And the final stage, the value of that output, is the value of the consumption goods, okay? So that's the way it works. Now, 
There's an early stage production that might be something like product development, uh, and a late stage production that's inventories at retail. And Kane's argument about paradox of thrift, it applies to the inventory management, but doesn't apply to the uh, product development option, okay? Because it's early stage and is influenced by the interest rate. I use five stages and recognize that those stages mean, mean two different things, really. One of them is that those are things going on in the economy at any given point in time. If we took field trips in here, uh, we could go out and, and about and see mining operations and timber operations and manufacturing operations and transportation stuff and some retail, and they're all going on at once. But the alternative, uh, Interpretation is they show that sequence. So in other words, for any stage at this point in time, the, the associated consumption output will be removed in time. So the, the goods are moving through, producer goods are moving through the stages of production. Can we do that? Yeah, okay, they move through the stages of production. I didn't like the way they move. Lost my sound, okay. Uh, now, I'll remind you that th th this was the analytics clear back in 1931 uh, when Hyatt gave his prices in production, which was the same year that Henry Ford was still producing the Model A. That's how long ago it was. And Henry Ford was quite a person, you know, he didn't just produce automobiles, he actually owned the uh, mineral rights to, to get iron ore out of the ground and make engines. And he, he had almost the whole shebang there. So if, if Hayek had had PowerPoint, he could show you how the Model A's were produced. You know, it goes something like this. <laughs> yeah, it works. Okay. I better move along here. Uh, so this is just a summary interpretation. The structure, of course, is much more complicated as Herbener uh, explained. Uh, and we're showing here, just linking up with the PPF, that when the PPF expands, just as a matter of secular growth, we're not talking about a change in the interest rate here, uh, the, uh, the triangle increases in size as well, okay? Uh, this is secular growth. In other words, it's not induced by a lowering of the interest rate or it's not induced by credit, it's just ongoing growth because people aren't spending all of their income in the current period. <clears throat> More importantly, when they save, uh, they send two signals that seem to be conflicting, at least if you have a Keynesian mindset, uh, and this, it decreases the demand for inventories, but at the same time it increases the demand for longer term projects. Uh, and so. Reduced interest rates means more investment in the early stage, less investment in the late stage, okay? And so it's really conflicting <clears throat> only if you take Keynes model as the standard model, C plus I plus G. Does I go up or does I go down? Well, the important thing is that some I goes up and some I goes down. That's the disaggregation that, uh, that Hayek paid attention to. Okay, now, <clears throat> This is just a reminder of that. It says, watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. What do you expect you're going to see? You're going to see less investment in the late stage, more investment in the early stage. Let's watch. Resources are just moved out of the late stages and into the early stages. Right? That's the way it works. Okay. We can even show that with the PPF. Okay, and again, you get very consistent moves. Move along uh, the PPF, so you're getting more investment, okay, more investment, and disproportionately more uh, in the early stages. In other words, investment actually goes down in the late stages and up in the early stages, so you get that relative effect. That's important to the Austrian theory. So the structure have more of a future orientation, but that's completely consistent with your preference change. You want to save now 
to be able to borrow more or to be able to consume more in the future. So, so the market mechanisms are perfectly aligned uh, with your preference uh, change, all right? Watch the economy grow more rapidly. Okay, so now it's growing more rapidly. And I think it's instructive to, to look at it in terms of just uh, plotting consumption against time. And what you can see is the economy was always was was already growing, and then at some point you decided to save more, so the growth slowed down or even went negative for a short time, and then turned positive, but at a greater rate. Okay, so here is showing you that first consumption goes down, and then it goes up at a higher rate. It shows that with the uh, triangle too; it goes down and then up at a higher rate. Look at it on, on the grid below. It goes down and then it goes up at a higher rate. So what that means when we track consumption over time uh, is it ends up going higher than it would have gone uh, had you not saved in the first place. See, that'd be the old growth path there. And so the trade-off that's really being made is a trade-off between consumption in the near future, that's that crosshatch area, and consumption in the more remote future. Well, again, that's what your saving is all about. I'm starting to sound like your father again, but that's, that's what it's all about, okay? Now I can go through this pretty quickly. Stage-specific labor markets, it's movement in the labor market that helps bring this result about. And all I'm doing here is replacing my pictures of a few slides ago. Instead of showing somebody in product development, I'm showing the labor market in that area. Or instead of showing retail inventories, I'm showing the labor market in that area. And I could have three more labor markets if I have enough room on my screen, but I don't. Uh, and so I'll make do with two. The point is that those labor markets respond differently to a reduction in the interest rate, all right? And not surprisingly, you get a reduction in demand for labor at the late stage end and an increase in the demand for labor at the early stage end, okay? So let's watch this and see how it works. Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving and watch the labor market really because you've seen the other. So see the demand for labor at retail goes down, the demand for labor at product development in extraction industries and any kind of a long-term project. Real estate is always interest rate sensitive. In prices and production, Hayek even mentioned what he called a wage rate gradient. You can see it there, that while the economy is adjusting to the new structure, that wage rate gradient is what pulls workers out of the late stages and into the early stages. That's the way the market works, okay? Now we're ready for something of a grand finale and we haven't got to business cycles yet, but we'll get there and it'll be easy. Uh, I'm showing you uh, the whole shebang. There's, a, there's, there's the whole model. Uh, and this, when I pull the trigger on this one, do I have a watch? Yeah, watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. And what you're gonna see, I think, this is my humble opinion, is poetry in motion. I mean, this, this thing works, okay? So watch it respond in all the ways that you would expect, okay? Increased saving, reduced interest rates, movement along the frontier, uh, reshuffling of resources towards the early stages, labor markets that help bring that about, which will give rise in the future to higher levels of consumer output in accordance with people's willingness to save now in order to consume more in the future, all right? I put this up here. Uh, this is Steve Hankey. And I want this quote from Hankey, even though he's actually drawing from my book, Time and Money. I want this quote from him because he looks more stern than I can look. I can't look that stern. <laughs> can't do it. I can't do it, but you're gonna believe this guy. When interest rates, with interest rates artificially low, consumers reduce saving. They reduce saving, okay, in favor of consumption, and entrepreneurs increase the rate of investment spending. And then you have an in, imbalance between saving and investment. You have an economy on an unsustainable growth path. This, in a nutshell, is a lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 20s and 30s. So 
In other words, this is a prelude now, or just an introduction to how the market works badly when it's not allowed to work on its own, when it's working under conditions of uh, proactive interest rate policies by the Federal Reserve. Uh, credit expansion. I, that's just a loanable funds market again. But I'm going to do something different with it this time. Um, we're talking about new money. This is, this is not saving. This is new money. New money masquerades as saving. The supply of loanable funds shifts rightward, but without there being any increased saving. All right? Uh, and so I want you to see how, how radically different this is. We're not talking about the market for work at work for you and for me. We're talking about a policymaker uh, that <laughs> got his hand on the supply of loanable funds. Okay? Is this going to help us out? Is it going to help us out? Okay? Well, no. Uh, he increases. Uh, the amount of loanable funds, and notice it's not S plus to S prime, it's S to S plus delta M. In other words, it's just new money coming into the system uh, to give you that low interest rate. All right? Uh, and when that happens, uh, people respond in predictable ways. So pumping new money through credit markets drives a wedge between saving and investment. So the investors are moving down along their demand curve. In other words, interest rates lower, they want to invest more. But savers are moving down along their supply curve. In other words, their saving preferences have not changed. And the interest rate has fallen. So they think we'll save less, thank you very much. Why bother to save at that low rate? Might as well go ahead and consume. In micro, that would just be a shortage. And it would cause the problems immediately. But in macro, as applied to loanable funds, it's not a shortage because what would have been a shortage is made up by, guess what, newly printed money. Okay? So it's the Federal Reserve here that's papering over the shortage <coughs> with the newly created money. Now, of course, if you have any instinct of an economist at all, you know that's not going to fix things, is it? That's just going to postpone the ultimate reckoning. And so instead of getting an immediate shortage, you get a festering disequilibrium that eventually causes the economy to collapse into recession or worse, all right? So this is much of Hayek's writing uses this loanable funds framework, but he doesn't draw the graph, okay? He doesn't draw the graph, uh, but I'm sticking pretty close to Hayek here. Now, we can trace upstairs here and see what happens. You get really a double disequilibrium. Look at it from the consumer's point of view first, that, uh, I'm sorry, the investor's point of view first. <clears throat> they want to invest more, so they think in terms of moving rightward, you know, as if the economy were being pulled along the PPF in that direction. Consumers are headed the other direction. Right? This is not equilibrium, it's, it's uh, disequilibrium. Right? Uh, if we look at uh, the axes, we see that what's really going on here is that consumers are pulling northward and uh, investors are pulling eastward. Okay, because that's the way the axes line up. Uh, and, the, and the resultant force on that is to push the economy beyond the PPF uh, to sort of a virtual equilibrium up there that you're not going to get to. You're not going to get there. You're not going to stay there even if you could get there. But for a time, the economy gets pushed, on, pushed beyond the frontier which means the unemployment rate gets pushed down below its natural level. You got more people working than would in ordinary healthy economy, and they're producing capital goods, they're producing consumer goods, and the economy is uh, booming, okay? If you look at the structure of production, it's getting conflicting signals. On the one hand, the low interest rate is suggesting that we need more higher order goods, but the, the spurt in consumption, because people aren't saving now, uh, drags resources in that direction too. So uh, it, it's conflicted. Uh, for loanable funds, we call it a, it's a wedge between saving and investment. For PPF, it's a tug of war between investors and consumers. For the triangle, 
uh, I'm indebted to John Cochran of Metropolitan State for calling it the dueling triangles, okay? Because the, 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 the signals are uh, conflicted, okay? Now, the result is you get overinvestment, you get more investment than you otherwise would, but more significantly, and this is the Austrian flavor, you get malinvestment, which Mises, a term Mises used to describe too much investment in the early stages, uh, you get overconsumption, uh, pushing beyond the frontier in the upward direction, uh, and you get that in the uh, PPF, or in the uh, structure of production as well. In fact, down here, Mises repeatedly uses the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption as characterizing the boom. And that's what he's talking about, all right? Now, the tuck, I mean, look at the language here. It's not the, it's not the language of the market working for you and for me. It's, it's the language of market forces at war with themselves due to the uh, intervention of the central bank. The tug of war that pits consumers against investors pushes the economy beyond the PPF. The low interest rate favors investment and in increasingly binding resource constraints keeps the economy from reaching the extra PPF point. Okay, it's a virtual point up there, they're not going to reach it. Okay, so how does this play itself out? Temporally conflicted structure of production, dueling triangles eventually turns boom into bust and the economy goes into recession and possibly into deep depression. Uh, let me call your attention to the orange arrow up there in the PPF. You're pushing outward, but with uh, investment bias because of the low interest rates, but eventually the resources available won't support that rate of growth and the economy turns the other direction uh, and falls into deep depression, okay? That's, that's the theory. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is that if you look at that long orange arrow, and you have to realize that that's the only part of the analysis that Keynes saw, and all of, all of the Keynesian theory is about the economy moving up or down along that long arrow. He doesn't see uh, the malinvestment because he doesn't have a structure of production. Okay. So let's put it all together here. We're just about through. We'll make it. Uh, put it all together here. Uh, and uh, This looks like a management course or something because I've got three Ps, but I can't resist. Padding the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Papering over the difference between saving and investment gives play to the tug of war between consumers and investors. Pitting early stage against late stages distorts the Hayekian triangle in both directions, the temporal discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. That's the essence uh, of the theory, okay? You can watch the uh, business cycle unfold. It looks something like that. Okay, gone. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't too happy with Greenspan, okay. A lot of people are too young to recognize this next guy. Anybody know who he is? Joe the Plumber. In other words, the ordinary businessman in the kitchen, people get it straight, you know, messing up the economy. Look at it in its simplicity. Here's the market at work for you and for me. Increased saving versus credit expansion, a summary comparison. First, saving supports genuine growth. Watch. So again, there's the poetry in motion with the market working right. Credit expansion triggers boom and bust. Watch. Here it goes. Yeah, I've got time for Voices in the Wilderness. Just to show you that this, this theory, yeah, I got it. This theory is not universally ignored. It's almost universally ignored, but not quite. And I've already showed you Steve Hanke in Forbes uh, early in 2008, saying here's what's coming down the line. And we know it because of the Austrian theory. Here's some more voices, the economists. This was back with the dot-com boom uh, buzzed. 
The Economist editorial view is a recent business cycle in both America and Japan displayed many Austrian features. Okay, it wasn't Keynesian, it wasn't monetarist, it was Austrian. Leyenhofer, a uh, Swedish economist, but with uh, sympathies for the Austrian school, and he's writing in 2008, says operating an interest targeting regime, keying on the CPI, so he's saying the Fed's manipulating interest rates. The Fed was lured into keeping rates far too low for far too long. The result was inflation of asset prices. Now that's not just plain old price inflation, it's certainly inflation of the money supply, but he's saying that the, that the rise in prices affected the early stage, the asset prices, not the consumer prices uh, so much. Uh, the result was uh, inflation of asset prices combined with a general deterioration of credit quality. So he's got risk factors in here which we can easily factor in. This, of course, does not make a Keynesian story. It is rather a variation on the Austrian overinvestment theme. And one more, I don't know this guy, uh, who in here does? Anybody know Forsyth? Have you seen him on, uh, on Fox? He's writing here for Barron's. Look what he says. But the Austrians were the ones who could see the seeds of collapse in the successive credit booms uh, aided and abetted by the Fed policies, especially under the former chairman, Alan Greenspan, who got huge kudos when he retired by Milton Friedman, by the way. While he disavows again, Greenspan disavows again, the responsibility for the boom and bust, most recently on Wednesday's Wall Street Journal op-ed page, monetary policy played a key role in creating successive bubbles and busts during his tenure of 87 to 06. Hey, that's my book. Okay, thank you much. <laughs>